Hey, Team Tolerator, we are still on our summer break from new episodes of To All the Men I've Tolerated Before. So this week, I will be giving you one of our still comfy movie reviews with Julia Washington from Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous and Jelly Pops Book Club. Still Comfy is where Julia and I were live once a week giving movie reviews about our favorite comfort movies from now our youth, our teenage years, just whenever we felt comforted by a movie and then we felt like we should revisit it to make sure we could still feel comfortable about it. Enjoy this audio version of Still Comfy. If you would like to see the video version, I have linked the YouTube playlist for our Still Comfy videos in the show notes. And there is also our Patreon page linked in the show notes. Patreon members are getting new content throughout the summer, whether it be on our free tier or any of our paid tiers, whether it be Team Tolerator check-ins, misogyny meltdown episodes, blog posts, or early access to episodes you might hear this fall that will be ad-free. Make sure to check out any of our Patreon tiers. They are all offering free trials. Have a great summer. I will see you this fall with all new episodes of To All the Men I've Tolerated Before. And here we are. We're live. It says it up in the corner. We did it. We did it. I'm so <laughs> we don't even have to question it. Yeah. It's just, no, y'all are live. Um, hi, everyone. This is Still Comfy with Jules and Nat. I'm Nat, and that's Jules. <laughs> and Still Comfy is an exploration. Has it been a while since we've done YouTube? We haven't done YouTube since before Christmas. Right. The last, did we do Love Actually? Was Love Actually was YouTube. the last one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We graciously bowed out of uh, the Mighty Ducks for the beginning of January. <laughs> we just bowed yeah, right out. We weren't ready. We weren't ready. And I wasn't ready. No. So instead, we are here today doing Mermaids, which mm-hmm. is the 1990s classic mm-hmm. with Cher raising one Winona writer. And I was right last week. You were, it is yeah. Christina. It's a baby Christina Ricci. Yeah, she had to have been like seven or eight. I I honestly did not comprehend that her and Winona Ryder were not the same age. So I was like, that can't be right. <laughs> oh. I have, because think about it. We all r- watched Winona Ryder and Christina Ricci movies relatively parallel to one another. Well, but so, but, but in the 90s, Winona Ryder was doing the more 20 year old stuff um how to make an american yeah. quilt little women reality bites yeah but i was a child during the 90s <clears throat> i mean me too i was like christina two when the movie came years. out two yeah because the movie came out in 90 i looked it up it barely oh, makes the oh. 90s oh no. right so they probably filmed in 89 mm-hmm. so i was six i was six mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yep yeah so Mermaids, I I could do the manic recap that I normally do, or I could read us a text exchange from Hot Mom. Oh, I vote for text exchange from Hot Mom. Sure. So I'm watching Mermaids last night because it's my job. And I text my mom because I like to brag about how cool my job is. And I'm like, hey, mom, I'm watching Mermaids with Cher because this is a movie we used to watch together when I was a child. She texts back a full hour and 40 minutes later. I love that movie. Was she and watching it before write... she texted you? <laughs> no. Go ahead. My family an hour and 40 largely minutes, that's how long ignores me. Is. Yeah. Oh, okay. My, my family largely ignores me. I'm so sorry. then I type back, Mom, no shade, but you allowed one of my favorite movies to be one where a 26-year-old social recluse Recluse deflowers a teenage Winona writer in a Catholic bell tower. And then today <laughs> she texted me, It's a beautiful movie. 
Well, I'm really glad that you brought up the 26 year old thing with you with your mom because after you recommended that we watch this, because remember, I've not seen this film before. Oh, you've and never seen Mermaid? No, because remember, I was sheltered with a capital shh. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm watching this, and I said, "Wait a minute! Did they just say Jake Ryan is 26?" Uh huh. It and- is also at 34 years old. That's the first time I've clocked it. I also. I don't know if I was only watching the made for TV version because we oh, and did maybe not they own it. this movie. Maybe and they maybe clipped, they it, clipped out. it. So they were like uh, a 26 year old Jake from 16 Candles just be feeling up children that he's driving to school because he's also her school bus driver. Bus driver, Yeah, because yeah. that scene is kind of racy for 1990. It truly is racy. I don't remember it being that racy. I remember the I remember JFK's death being the the center point of their physical relationship. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I do remember this. I did not remember, and maybe it was because I was a child watching this, so I don't know what penetration face looks like, but I <laughs> do not remember clocking the moment that yeah. he enters her body. But right. this time I was like, oh, no, because Winona's a star. <laughs> yeah. There is a clear moment on her face where she's like, and now he's inside of me. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And then also, but doesn't this movie take place over multiple years? Because didn't it say 1961? And then we had a Kennedy. There was New Year's. And then there was New Year's and they were in 64. So then I was like, wait a minute. Why isn't anybody aging? (laughs) Why isn't anyone aging? Also, it couldn't have taken place over several years because the whole thing about Cher is she never stays in town for a year. Right. So I don't know. Can, I don't think continuity was like a big thing in the I 90s. Think, I don't think yeah. people were like, there's no way that anyone's ever going to talk about our movie. So right. we don't have to pay attention. <laughs> right. That's true. I do want to take a moment and talk about how gorgeous Cher is. Cher is a literal goddess she's so fucking hot in this movie just stunning she i wrote at the very end of my notes after this whirlwind of of a movie i was like share the og hot mom oh (laughs) yes yes when all the girls were like to winona's character charlotte (laughs) your mom that look at there's my mom and it's there's like this my older woman who's kind yeah. of du- like frumpy clothes and her hair's kind of old looking and then they're like but look at your mom i want to be like your mom yeah and i truly believe that that's how my mom lived her life trying to emulate share by- from mermaids because I mean, we watched I- this movie a lot when i was a child <laughs> and I- i'm like mother and, like, she also let me watch because late at night they would play the racier Dirty Dancing with the actual mm-hmm. sex scenes and the mm-hmm. abortion. Mm-hmm. So my mother would also allow me to come downstairs from my bedroom as a child and be like, oh, are you not sleeping? What if we watch Dirty Dancing, the racy version, <laughs> the racy every racy. night that you're supposed to be, like, preparing for school the next day or whatever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I knew all... Like, I knew every sex scene by heart in Journey Dancing, and I'm like, the choices. <laughs> I did sneak Journey Dancing quite a bit when I was a kid. The choices that we made as mm-hmm. as an adult. I do have a question for you. Okay. So, Cher is, like, the OG hot single mom. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about how, in the 90s, we portrayed single moms as just floozies who needed to get out of town if she got a reputation isn't it funny i was like i bet natalie's gonna ask me about single mom shit (laughs) i am because i'm a single mom i have because i'll let you answer i have an answer to this question i just like i have no frame of reference it's just respectful for me to answer it i okay so here so i had a couple of things going through my head about the whole thing one it was like okay so it's the 60s so a woman Mm -hmm. really does need a man to survive because and we talked about that for now and then yes and that's the structure of our culture even still to this day if you don't live in the right area for career advancement it's you're you basically are dependent on getting married or having a sugar daddy of some kind um and then just this idea 
that she's a floozy was like kind of frustrating because right. I felt like that was a very male lens to see her through. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the director, I don't think the writers are, I think there was some, I don't remember the, the names in the credits, if it was female or not, but it was really frustrating because the way that they sort of lead you into this whole, like, she has to leave because she's fucked up. She's a but, broken woman. But, and, she, and then you have this guy who com- shows up who's just adorable. Lou is a gem. He's Lou a is gem. a gem. And that's He's a dream. gem. It's to find somebody like that. And then, you know, you get a little insight about how, like, with Charlotte's dad, he just wasn't into it, which is typical. Yeah. Um, and then with... um. Katie's dad it was just kind of like well that happened <laughs> whoopsie well, and um, then he just drove away into the night into the night and so it leans all of the responsibility of child rearing on the woman and none on the man and what I saw towards the end of the film was here's a just another woman who's victim of the system because she just wanted to be in love and she wanted a little bit of freedom and she didn't want to conform in the way, but she still wanted to be loved. Um, and then, you know, she had to figure out how to survive and she's being punished for it. Well, and my answer to this is when my mother and I were watching this, um, just us girls it was very much a we're gonna watch this because it's about Cher and truly Winona Ryder but Christina Ricci plays a bigger role in the movie than normally for the little kid who's in the midst of the teenage mom experience and we're gonna talk about mommy and daughter dynamics and I was like oh that'll be a good one to do and then I watched it and I was like oh this movie literally makes women out to be the devil like yeah women are evil in this world <laughs> yeah and you really see that a lot too in Winona Ryder's character because she's so desperate to be a nun so you can only be two things a nun right or a slut yeah this movie is what they need to show in philosophy classes if you're ever talking about the Mad- Madonna whore uh pair or no opposite spectrum uh, yeah <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, were you going to say paradigm? paradigm? Paradigm. Yes. That's what. Because, okay. you know, like, I feel like people talk about that, about like, mm-hmm. you're either Madonna, you're either the Virgin Mary, mm-hmm. or you are a whore, and there is nothing in between. <laughs> And and still to this day, there's no allowance for in between. Look at how they crucified Samantha Jones on Sex in the City. You know what I mean? Like that was released in 1998 and, and ran until 2006. And they still just, I don't know, didn't understand her character. The other thing that I thought was really interesting about Winona, Charlotte's, Charlotte, the character Charlotte mm-hmm. was um, her fascination with Catholicism. Right. Even though mom repeatedly says we're Jewish, but we don't really practice. So and I do you and know, I go ahead. I have a funny connection. My mother over Christmas told me that when she was Charlotte's age or mm-hmm. younger, because I guess Charlotte is 18 in the movie, or at least that's what she tells the doc doctor, but we will get to that triggering. Oh scene. my god, that scene. <laughs> um so anyways. When my mom was a preteen or a young girl or whatever, she read one book about a Jewish family and she decided that that Jewish family was cool. Mm-hmm. And therefore she asked her dad, why can't we be Jewish? And he goes, because we're Christians. We're just Croatian Christians. <laughs> that's, that's who we are. <laughs> and she's like, mm, not into it. So that made me giggle watching mermaids just go around, watching her just like fiercely being want to be a saint <laughs> yeah and it in just the way she unpacks some of the things about catholicism you know i didn't realize until just now or not just now but it, within the last six or seven months of my life and really coming to head with this film just how scary the concept of the immaculate mm-hmm. conception is mm-hmm. because she has no idea that kissing won't get her pregnant and we know this like this is a right. running joke within in movies all the time and television all the time with with kids who don't understand sex because we don't talk about it we don't have education about it blah blah um 
but the genuine and actual fear she feels because she's kissed a boy and now she must be pregnant because, you know, Mary didn't do anything and she, she got anything. pregnant. She was just like, around. Like, that's horrifying. <laughs> it is horrifying. And then you layer a to- on top when she's in her manic episode and she steals Cher's car and drives away. She screams out the window, I want a life that is exciting and vibrant or something. Yeah. And I was like, oh, because all of the saint scare- uh, stories, especially saintly women stories, terrifying. Right. Burned at the sit take beheaded all of it i was like so she also wants to be a saint not just to be like holy and godly and to have some sort of like structure Mm -hmm. but she wants to be a saint because she also feels like that's the only way she can be exciting without being a hoe like her mom right even though her mom is just trying to survive she's not really a hoe she's just playing this the game that she was told she had to play to survive my um my resounding note through this entire movie was Cher was not that bad of a mom. <laughs> I was like, I, really? Like, truly? I oh, like, so your worst crime is because you pick up and relocate every year? Like, okay, right. army brats have the same experience. I was on, honestly, I was like, she doesn't even pick on Charlotte that much for the Catholicism thing. She yeah. just like rolls her eyes and walks away from it. And she's like, just so you know, we're Jewish. And then, like, when she moves to Greek mythology, because all of us weird girls have our Greek mythology era, um, Cher's like, we're not Greek either. So I just, yeah. I guess, keep looking. <laughs> Doesn't keep trying to figure it out. The other part, too, that kind of bothered me about the lens that we see this film in some ways uh, when it comes to the women was, like you said, just how bad all the women are yeah and the hyper charge of charlotte's sexualization like i in listening to pod meets world today i realized that maybe that is some people's truth in reality it wasn't mine i was always boy crazy but it wasn't like at 14 i wasn't like oh my god i need to make out with a boy and I think when I was younger, the running commentary in her head, how we hear each one of her intrusive thoughts Mm -hmm. was funny because it is funny. Like, it's funny for like Winona Ryder to have never even considered looking at a boy and one hot to trot 26 year old recluse named Joe shows up and she's like, I don't know. I can only think about taking off his pants. I don't even know what's going to be there when I do it. Right. (laughs) But I guess it's more like, like, is that in, is that our innate desire to be nude? Because, you know, with the, I like to call, you know, the Christian stories <laughs> that we were the told Christian as children stories. and being naked in the Garden of Eden, <laughs> you know, is, I, is, I don't know, you know what I mean? It's like one of those things where I'm just like, how do, I don't even know how I ever thought those things as a child, if I ever thought those things as a child. I just never like the whole I don't know I don't know I don't know what I'm trying uh, to say I just it's always so interesting to me when I learn about when other people had their sexual awakening because I grew up in a very repressed household so my parents tried to ignore the fact that sex existed but also would let me read and watch whatever the hell I wanted right so So you had all this exposure from literature and pop culture I remember being a horny preteen like I remember being like a horny little gremlin and just like you know reading books I mean like this is what sex is like and it's brilliant (laughs) and it's lovely and I cannot wait to do it and that's why there's an entire episode dedicated on my podcast to losing my virginity and like literally trying to give it away to the highest bidder like uh who's coming over See, and that's who's not, doing this that wasn't my experience and we and i got a lot of very heavy-handed messaging about like you need to be careful about who you give it to and once you give it away you can't have it back and you know the consequences are yours to bear and yours alone like it wasn't ever you know this presented as this magical experience that you can enjoy with so even though i'm watching you know television of the 90s and there's all this comedy around sex and whatever there's still this very heavy-handed church i mean they had fucking purity Mm -hmm. ceremonies for crying out loud like it was to find one movie that has like a purity dance like a purity ball where you marry your dad saved (laughs) 
oh yes that's exactly what we do when, i love saved when saved came out and i watched it i was like holy shit Another... i thought i was the only one who went through a private school experience private religious school experience like this listen this is why when we watched this is us and you told me you didn't think uh, mandy moore was a great actress i got mad because i'm thinking of how to deal and saved and a walk to remember mandy moore of my youth <laughs> and how and even just like lana from the princess diaries just singing her little stupid cupid song i'm like mandy can do it all <laughs> including dementia like give the girl her due yeah. <laughs> mandy's got it um also christina ricci has always talked like 30 year old christina ricci there right. was like one line where i was like put a cigarette in her hand <laughs> just like with the knowledge of like kings that came from atlantis christina ricci that's how she talks right I didn't realize she started acting so young either. Like, I knew she was, like, a, quote, child actor. Mm -hmm. But, like, I'm thinking, you know. So cute. Now so and then weird. and um, Casper and what else was yeah. she in where she was younger-ish? I don't know. I don't know. I, I love her to pieces. I'm a huge Christina Ricci nerd. Um, I love Yellow Jackets. I will watch anything that Christina Ricci and Winona Ryder. I like, was going to ask you what your favorite Christina Ricci is. What's my favorite Christina Ricci? I don't know. Now and then Christina Ricci. Ramona. I, I think I agree. Yeah. I wasn't like a huge Casper lover. Like we watched it a lot. And oh, I thought Devin Sawa was so cute. Listen. I haven't gotten bold enough to tell Devin Sawa that he needs to be on the show to talk to us about Wild America. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I and I just think he's adorable. And like he's not some weirdo either. Like I no. follow him on on or I was following him on Twitter. I don't open Twitter anymore. And I was just like, You're you seem like a solid dude. He's a great man. Um no, we all got horned up for Casper turning into Devin Sawa. And then I'm like, should I be having sex with ghosts? Like in all of the <laughs> Anne Rice books? I also oh read God. a series by Meg Cabot called the Mediator series where she was trying to fuck ghosts. And she was like 15. And I was like, should I should I just like give up on corporal boys and and try to fuck ghosts? Maybe they'll like me. Maybe. <laughs> and this just in, Mermaids is Christina Ricci's uh, first feature film cute as a button cute as a cute button as a button let's talk and about then, the oh the adams family i guess okay yeah the adams family i mean she's like 10 go ahead i'm gonna say it i'm gonna say it right now i don't like the wednesday show <laughs> oh i, I haven't like, watched it <clears throat> i think that the adams family is truly only charming as a unit you don't want to watch them solo because then it's weird because then it's not all of them then it is literally just wednesday saying bummer things all the time <laughs> it was designed it was designed to be an ensemble so yeah yeah they are the adams family mm -hmm. i <laughs> so, haven't watched it so i don't have an opinion i i missed the entire family the entire time i was like mm, you know what would make this show great if morticia and gomez were in it more <laughs> well and i love how much morticia and gomez just loved each other yes like, it yes. was so refreshing to be, like, they didn't have that sitcom quibble bullshit of, like, my wife is annoying and my husband's a knucklehead. They the were Adams just, like, Family is a sexy show. Yeah. It's a sexy show. And if you take out Morticia and Go Gomez, there's no more sexy and I'm not interested. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not interested. Which after is why you didn't like the Wednesday Adam show. After all of that, after everyone threw their fits over what's her name and what's his face playing Morticia and Gomez. Oh, Catherine Zeta Jones and who is the guy? I don't I never know his name. I gotta go ahead. But Good I job. was a huge Catherine Zeta Jones uh rom com fan as a child too. Because again, oh, I, I was love... unsupervised. Oh well, I love her. She uh -huh. was amazing in high fidelity. Yes. Also, 
this mermaids movie has the sexiest soundtrack i've ever seen and i was oh. like is this movie why i know every word to peggy lee's fever oh excuse me <laughs> angelica houston what what did Catherine didn't Catherine zeta jones play morticia in the new wednesday move uh, show got it yeah <laughs> okay in the movie with christina ricci yeah it's angelica. angelica houston i got confused um also oh yeah the soundtrack I, slaps sorry to yeah. keep i was I just am, confirming details so i am I literally am. convinced that my mom did use this as a blueprint to raise me because there is nothing that my mom loves more than to throw a bunch of frozen appetizers in the uh oven and be like it's fun dinner yeah i even made a dip <laughs> oh that's cute i do i mm, that's interesting my mother was very in a we sat down at a table we had a meal like that family that Christina, mm -hmm. that Charlotte stumbles upon because the car yeah. runs out of gas finally. That I was like, oh, family. that's my family. <laughs> um, no, like my mom was, oh, my mom's not a very good cook. It's like the thing. Like she's not a oh. good cook. Like she, she tries her best, but then like diet culture gets the best of her. And then she'll be like, what about California? uh cauliflower crust pizza and i'm like no one fucking wants that that's like <laughs> no one wants it no. i don't want squash spaghetti i want real spaghetti <laughs> i do you. okay i do love squash spaghetti and zucchini I lasagna i do love those things but i also love i feel like zucchini lasagna is still a nod to italia you know it's still just not as heavy but i do love to make lasagna i make my sauce from scratch also, my mom, one time my uncle made fun of me in the car because I didn't know that it wasn't normal to sing every time a song was playing. That what? You know. It's totally normal to sing every time a song so comes on the radio. We're in the car and my uncle and my aunt are very silent people. And my cousins are little because it's my mom's youngest brother. Mm -hmm. And he is driving me back to either my house or he picked me up to take me to my grandma something. It's a long car drive. And I unconsciously am singing every song i know to the radio because that like is who doesn't do I that do it, i do it at the grocery store yeah because and like that kitchen scene at the end was when showtime decided that my picture needed to be shitty and i'm like this is my favorite scene showtime get your shit showtime. together because that's how one year my mom bought me for christmas the horse of a different color album Nice. from big and rich because it had that song save a horse ride a cowboy mm -hmm. uh, again i'm like 12 or 13 and my mom's like you know what our favorite song should be as a family save a horse, <laughs> save ride, a a horse cowboy. ride a cowboy i Let's mean it's bump and grind <laughs> good advice though depending on like, the cowboy she's like and we knew word for word the entire album she bought it because she thought that it was funny that i knew all the words to that song and it made my dad mad she also taught me all of the words to meet Lowe's Paradise at a da um, by the dashboard lights. And then my grandma got embarrassed when I performed it at a cousin's wedding. Oh, wow. <laughs> the DJ noticed that I knew all of the words. So he just handed me a microphone. I'm not going to not take the microphone. Yeah, and yeah. again, I'm a 13 year old singing about like 17 year olds fucking by the light of their dashboard in a car. <laughs> You know what? There we did do karaoke one time. What's that Charlie X C X C X song? I can hear it in my head. That's not helpful to you. But a little girl got on stage and was basically like singing a song about how she wanted to like. Yeah, I think kids sing and every song. I, literally, is <laughs> everybody. But this is like an eight-year-old, so like in public. So like it's like one of the only karaoke places in town. Mm -hmm. So everyone in the room just got quiet and like really uncomfortable. <laughs> you don't think I'm a twelve-year-old who can perform "Paradise" by the Dashboard Lights beat by beat, surprisingly, at your cousin's wedding? <laughs> Unless you were an eight-year-old performing that song in the car. <laughs> the difference here is that you were in, like, controlled environments. This was in a very uh, public yeah. place. Don't take your kids to bars. And it was it was a bar. And I was like, how are they getting away with this? And then it turns out that before 10, it's all ages. After 10, you have to be over 21. So the mom brought the child in before 10. And the person that I was with, ironically, 
and I say ironically because you're just kind of like, but you ch- actively cheat on your husband mm-hmm. all the time, but you're uncomfortable with this. <laughs> with this. The eight-year-old living her blitz. <laughs> yeah. Like, she was so upset that she just would, like, start just, like, talking. Oh, it, it was, oh my anyway, God. It was, it, was not, it was not a fun night. Also, my mom stressed me out too much that I didn't learn to drive until I was 17. Oh, I was 19. <laughs> And I wrote down, I was like, shall we share our learning how to try drive trauma? Because my dad let me drive into a ditch and then <gasps> told me, like, a really deep ditch. That's scary. Like, a deep, forested ditch. He yeah. let me turn into a ditch. Didn't try to be like, hey, Natalie, it's a little wide. Or, hey, Natalie, you're cutting the curb a little close. Nothing. Just sat there silently. Oh, my God. Allowed me to, d- to like, get the car like this into a ditch. And then proceeded to tell me, figure it out. Because what no, if I wasn't not, here? No, that's not how you teach somebody how to I do something got, so they can figure it out when you're not there. Yeah, I burst into tears and got out of the car. I burst into tears and I got out of the car and I was like, we're not that far from home. I'll walk. Honestly, that's not, I'm not okay with that. That and makes then, me really upset. <laughs> so then it was my mother's turn to teach me how to drive because my father made me cry one too many times. So then my mom was the opposite of Cher, where she wanted me to be signaling like two miles ahead. She'd be like, do you see the car? <laughs> do you see? I was like, all of those cars are, are parked, mom. We haven't yeah. le- left the subdivision. I immediately just stopped. I was like, I just won't drive. <laughs> see, so my parents didn't even bother. They just hired somebody to teach me how to drive. Oh, I took driver's ed because I think you have to in Indiana to get your license. You, if you're under a certain age, if you're under 18, you have to do behind the wheel training with a professional mm-hmm. company. I don't know about other states though. And then my parents get- over 18. I was over 18 when I got my life and my parents were still like, we're hiring somebody to teach you how to drive. Honestly, uh, they should have call one of my uncles, call one of those clear headed Croatian men to come and spend the weekend with us and teach me how to drive because they have taught everyone how to drive at eight years old. Yeah. <laughs> In cornfields, yeah, in vacant parking lots. So call one of them up and just be like, "Can you sit in the car with yeah. Natalie while she cries behind the wheel <laughs> and tells her it's gonna be okay?" Um, then she my family, too. then my family is inconvenienced that I don't know how to drive. So then at every family function, they bring it up. Can you believe this one? Old maid over here refuses oh. to learn how to drive. I go because you guys are traumatizing. <laughs> yeah i hate maybe, that maybe we shouldn't let 16 year olds learn how to drive like it just feels very volatile for all of us and it's in every state right because ohio you had to be older well i don't know if this is still true oh no new jersey i don't know if this is still true but when we were visiting ohio for a family event because i have family in ohio mm-hmm. um and my cousins from New Jersey, like we all came in. So my cousins from New Jersey were annoyed because my brother could get his permit at 15. And they were like, we can't do that. We had to wait until 17 because of like some state law or something. I don't know. I side with that state. Maybe yeah. like the age of, you know, consent and all of it. It should just be 25. <laughs> Did I ever be- tell you this story where I was at a bar one night for a, a private event? There was like 75 people there. And three or four of us were like 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. We were over, we were legal adult age when we got our driver licenses. So they did a casual poll. How many people have a DUI? Literally everybody who had their license at 16 has had a DUI. All of us who did not get our license until adulthood were like, we're cool. We didn't have a DUI. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. It's because you've been driving too long and you're too (laughs) comfortable. Um, and then the reputation, because this movie deals greatly into how one thing will make your reputation just yeah. go off the rails. Then the reputation in my family became that I was the bad driver because oh. I didn't like practicing. And then it's like anytime you have a kerfuffle in the car is because you're the bad driver. Yeah. <laughs> So now I refuse to drive people places because I was like, you don't want to get in the car with me. I'm the bad driver. I always preface it with things like, even though my parents made me do behind the wheel, my dad was the bulk of the, like, let's get in the car and practice. Because you have to have so many hours before they let you take your license test, right? Yeah. And um, so now when people get in the car with me, I'm always like, cop taught me how to drive. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Enter at your own risk. <laughs> 
also during my driver's ed test during the driving portion mm -hmm. it came to they told you sometimes you have to parallel park and sometimes there's not time for it so they don't oh. make you do it so you drove and real slow so you wouldn't have to i tried and then he was like oh look a perfect place to parallel park <gasps> no like, me and i just looked at the man and i was like hi i need you to know that my parents chose to not teach me how to parallel park because they're selfish and <laughs> could you just walk me through it and yeah. i still can't parallel park to this day i have oh, a backup man. camera people make fun of me they're like Natalie, you should be able to parallel park you have a backup camera i and actually I'm like, think but it's harder with the backup <laughs> camera i don't only, i don't use mine i only use my backup camera to make sure i'm like like i can stay where i'm at once i've like positioned myself also, let, so the purity complex in this movie. So, mm -hmm. like, Winona Ryder is on her way to sainthood, the virgin Madonna, until her mother was like, I don't care if you fuck that 26-year-old. <laughs> I did. I write, wrote down, yeah, because I didn't know he was 26. I thought it was, like, 16 candles where he no. had just graduated no. or something. He is, like, full-ass full adult. Girl, man. He's had an entire living girlfriend yes. who left town. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Who, so, you know, in the rumors around his living girlfriend, did he get her pregnant? There oh, might yeah. be a little Joe Jr. running around. And, and that gets in her head. And then that aids, that contributes to her, like, psychosis about being pregnant. And I'm like, hey, Cher, maybe we cool it on having Winona be so, like, happy and gun ho and mm -hmm. kind to the recluse <laughs> who worked every job in town. And yet, cannot speak to anybody <laughs> yeah 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 the original sad boy it's like oh you should fall in love with a sad boy because then <laughs> sad boys aren't sad anymore because you make them happy yeah i'm always gonna call him jake ryan i honestly didn't realize he had done i thought he had only done one movie I think like i knew he had done like a handful one. of movies but yeah. i thought that 16 candles was his only like big one I'm not saying that Mermaids is a big movie. I I don't think anyone but me could honestly <laughs> walk into a room and be like, let's discuss the plot of Mermaids. Mermaid. It's just a movie that my mother loved, and therefore we watched it all the time. It's and I do love this movie. And I do think it, like, really highlights the complexities of, mm -hmm. like, women living together in general. Yeah. And the way that women are pitted up against one another. I thought she I was like, when she was putting on her mom's makeup and dress or whatever, I was like, does she try to fuck Lou? Is that where this movie is going? And I just forgot. Does she try to fuck Lou? <laughs> because My worst... Go ahead. Because her mom kissed uh, Joe. Joe. And I'm yeah. like, we don't need to up the ante by trying to get Lou to molest you. <laughs> like, yeah, I was, I was like, please don't. I really don't want Lou to turn into some kind of bad guy because he's no. such a good guy. And I really like, okay, so when Cher freaks out about how close Lou is getting to her girls, like mm -hmm. that's such a real moment because you get so comfortable and used to the environment being just you and your children mm -hmm. that anytime something somebody else sort of gets involved it sh obviously it shifts the dynamics and all these things but there's a real fear because like will your kids be honest with you if they don't like this person right and and you know here's the scene where they're where he does this amazing incredible thing for these girls building like the underwater or whatever that and I'm they're currently just currently in Yes. And they're just having this, um, like, there are bio dads who aren't even that good, you know? And so right. Cher picks a fight with him and it just, it breaks my heart. But also at the same time, it's like self-defense in a way, because he, what's his emotional investment? These aren't his kids. He can pick up and leave because if her, the people who gave her these children can pick up and leave, then a man who didn't, who isn't related yeah. biologically can pick up and leave. Well, and I'm a sicko who grew up in stranger danger culture. So my first thought when a guy gets attached to my single friend's kids is like, what's your fucking deal? Why are right. you so attached to my friend's kids? Right. I mean, we weren't even allowed to spend the night at friends' homes if mom and or dad had a live-in 
boyfriend and or like slash or girlfriend Mm -hmm. like that's how serious my parents were about like stranger danger and like how close it is to proximity of the person who does do harmful things to children because everyone thinks it's going to be some like some guy in a weirdo off of the street (laughs) yeah (laughs) but it's really just like it's like an uncle or someone's boyfriend or what have you school bus Mm -hmm. (laughs) mm-hmm And then, so that was like a thing I had to like work through myself when I became a a parent because then it turns into like all I heard when my child was very, very young, all I could hear was my parents. Well, and they were actively saying this shit. It wasn't just like it Mm -hmm. stopped because I grew up. It was like, now you have a beautiful child. So here we're going to remind you of the horrors and dangers of the world and the things that could happen to him. And you're just like, I need all the noise to stop so I can know, so I know how to manage and navigate this, please. Cause parenting is hard enough as it is. Well, yeah. And I like throughout the entire movie because, uh, what's his name? Gil? What's his name? Lou. Because Lou is <laughs> a like, Gil. Who the fuck is Gil? I was like, it's not Joe. Joe's the one that fucks Winona. Um, yeah, Lou. Because Lou is such a gem, I just kept reminding myself, like, we know that he doesn't turn out to be a creep. We know right. that he doesn't turn out to be a creep. He is a very nice man. Thank God that we already know that he's a very nice man. Because oh, had we have made this movie in the millennial age, I bet you it would have been a back to school special about how mom's boyfriends are creeps. <laughs> yeah, because we can never allow for men what is what is i mean i understand you know you actively are in the camp of all men are trash i recognize and understand that i also find it very frustrating that we have very few positive male representation roles in media because you know it's like why can't we have more of that so that way it's like because if we're learning how to behave from pop culture so were they so were they so if all they're seeing is violence perpetuated then like what is like that's not having a positive impact we need more lose in the world yeah no i remember having two of the the two guys off of um well jd has a new podcast now but when jd and Co- ghost came on my podcast like we were talking about pop culture in reference to like what women did you have crushes on mm-hmm. when you were a kid from pop culture and what did that make you think that like dating women was going to be like because i'm right. thinking of like heidi from tool time and like like right. we grew up in a ridiculous age of just like sexualizing women because someone's gotta so the men turn tune in and we right. make money right and i remember just being like well how do you guys feel about how you're portrayed as like lectures <laughs> in the fucking like every teen show mm-hmm. has some creepy boy up against the locker pushing it a little too far <laughs> yeah what did they say I'm, you know, everyone we need to would go back have to revisit. To the we would just have to revisit that episode. Yeah, but I, I do think... like. Again, I will always say that the patriarchy and misogyny is everyone's problem. It's just yeah. not my problem. It's men's problem. Yeah, Why am I scared hard... of men? Because I've been conditioned to be scared of men. Because my go-to is you're scary. Right. It's it is harmful for everybody, and that's the thing. And and the men who do want who are different and want different things or changing who don't fit the norm of the patriarchy are you know victims too of harassment and ridicule and that's just not okay because it's it needs okay. to be it needs to be oh it just needs to be okay for all of us to be varying degrees of whatever because the system doesn't re- the system shouldn't require that share has to be a woman who needs to jump from man to man to man to survive also, I didn't think that she was way out of left field or cold hearted or that she even treated Lou that badly when she was like, when she had that meltdown mm-hmm. and he was like, you're cold and all of this. And like, you never even think about us. I go, I feel like we're just demonizing Cher right. for literally being careful. Right. Women aren't given the luxury of being careless, but we're also not given the luxury to be careful. Right. 
Right. It is hard because you do have to sort, again, you have that in your mindset of men are bad. They're going to touch your children inappropriately. How do you navigate? Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes people don't want to wait to find out whether or not you really aren't a harmful person. Like I've put in all this work. Why are you, why are you still resistant? It's like, it's not resistance. It's getting comfortable. Like it take it t- it can take people 30 fucking years to realize their parents shouldn't be a part of their lives. It, I'm allowed to take a long time to figure out whether or not I want you in my life. No kidding. It's ridiculous. I was like, I really don't think that Cher's acting left field out of, during this entire movie at all. I go, she's pretty chill about the kid wanting to be a nun. She takes the little one to swim practice all the time, even though it's boring. She goes to the fucking baseball hall of fame. You think I'm going to the baseball hall of fame? No. I want to go to the baseball hall of fame. <laughs> you told me that they took down the peaches stuff. So what am I going to look at at the yeah. baseball hall of fame? I don't know. I'm sorry. I still want to go. I grew up watching baseball. Like, they took down the shit I'd care about. Yeah. It was a special exhibit <laughs> for those special four years that we let women play baseball. <laughs> play baseball. Um, but yeah, it's just... And then I truly think, because I was thinking about it today, I was like, why did Cher just sign off with her dating Joe? And I was like, I don't think she meant to. I think she saw that Winona Ryder got like a little antsy in her pantsy over Joe. Mm-hmm. And she was like, now would be the age, Charlotte, where we could talk about you dating. Yeah. I don't think she gave her the green light to go fuck a grown man in a bell tower. <laughs> well, and I think that's why she kind of, she leaned into the kiss, like yeah. as a, as a, because she never, like you said, she wasn't really giving her permission. It was more of like, I'm teasing you because you have some yeah. feelings in your pants. And I think that's why she kissed him because it was more of a, we know that you shouldn't, we both know that you're not going to do anything. But that was after, right? Was that after? No. That, that was before. So the New Year's Eve kiss happens. And then Winona, and then Charlotte declares war yes, on... Okay. Mrs. Fletcher is that <laughs> the only caller by her first Flax. her last name? Yeah, Mrs. Flax. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, anyways, I and I was like, oh my gosh, I go. This is why you have to be careful about what you say to kids, especially a kid who has taken every word of the Bible as truth. You can't just look at a kid and be like, date Joe. I dare you, because then that yeah. kid's gonna be like, fine. <laughs> Mommy said it was fine. I can Mommy do it, said it and was not fine. and not understand the new one. And she hasn't, you know, for better or worse, her social skills are probably not the greatest because they've moved around a lot. So she probably doesn't understand the teasing of like, "Ooh, you think this boy is cute? I'm gonna dare you. I dare you. I dare you to do something about it. I triple dog dare you. I triple dog dare you. Also, I I would love to have the attitude of that one girl who was in the bathroom just giving like graphic play by play. Oh my gosh! I, I was know. like, look, I was like, number one, this is like the '60s, the early '60s. I was like yeah. the gall of this young girl just right. in the bathroom, just being like, and then he moaned, and I loved it. I was like, oh. <laughs> You're the reason why (laughs) all of these girls. Oh, and then, so, the drowning. So, Charlotte's hooking up with Joe, Jake Joe, Joe, in a bell tower because she's drunk on hooch. (laughs) Dressed like her mama. Dressed like her mama. And, number one, like, I was a visceral like sexy sex scene, and I'm like, oh, now I'm even more uncomfortable. Yes. I couldn't believe how much they showed. And then I was like, how old was it Winona Ryder when they filmed this movie? So I had to look up what year she was born and then kind of do the math of like, okay, so maybe they filmed in 88, 89. So she was technically an adult, but she's playing a child. Yeah. And Katie drowns. Um, little kid also drunk on hooch. <laughs> I love in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, your kids just accidentally got drunk and no one knew. (laughs) I'm sorry. My lights are... Oh. My lights are doing weird stuff today, too. Is my house cursed or something? 
I don't know. I think electricity is weird and volatile. No wonder everybody was scared of it over 100 years ago. Good Lord. The lights just went out on their own. And then I had a moment of like, oh, the power's out. No, the power's not out because my ring light's still on. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, but that's, yeah, that's plugged into the wall. (sighs) Whatever. Who knows? I'm going to turn on a backup light just in case it happens again. So... Katie drowns because she's also drunk on hooch because no one's monitoring children. It's the 60s. And the and the nuns, these beautiful pure nuns who just like get her out of the river or whatever. Okay, here's the thing. I was confused on how the nuns knew she was there. I think one of them had a lantern. Maybe they do night rounds. I was wondering, I was like, do they do night patrols? Like, is that a I don't thing? know what nuns do. What do nuns do all day? <laughs> don't they? what do what do nuns do all day maybe it was moonlight prayer time or something and they were walking from different points of the monastery convent convent well she called it a monastery oh I she thought. called it a monastery yeah i think con- hmm. i don't know how they're different a, a monastery is monks no oh maybe she called it the convent then um but in- <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't know. A lot of religious I don't know. shit I had to block because of trauma. It's fine. So anyways, these beautiful nuns get Christina Ricci out of the river. And my only note of this traumatic drowning scene is, oh, God, Charlotte is always going to connect sex to this uh-huh. awful moment in her life. And she will never have an orgasm. She's primed for becoming a nun. Yeah. She will never have an orgasm. This poor, poor kid. Because yeah. all she knows... And wh- what else? Oh, it was Dimension 20. So Dimension 20 is currently doing scary fairy tales for their okay. campaign. Okay. And Emily Ashford is playing Little Red Riding Hood. And she made a point last week or the week before. I don't know. I rewatched a bunch of them this weekend. Um, to re-up on my knowledge of what had actually gone on. But she made the point to say that, like, well, yeah, when adults were in the fairy tales, it was get married happily ever after. Mm -hmm. When the kid was at the center of the fairy tale, it was you fucked up. Here's your punishment. Yeah, it's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale. Pinocchio lied once and had to be a donkey. Like, (laughs) because Pinocchio also had that meltdown where he's like, Pinocchio would like to know why other people can make mistakes and that's fine and there's forgiveness and grace and whatever and then whenever he makes a mistake literally we're getting eaten by a whale or i'm turning into a donkey or my dad's getting hurt like and then you got emily over here playing little red riding hood and she's like no it's for me too like i made one mistake and now i am a werewolf like none of this makes sense or feels right or true and she's like, I've just decided that all of the grownups are wrong and the morals are wrong and fuck all of it. And I was like, I kind of like that. <laughs> I do, too. I do, too. Because think about, like, there's such a grayness to the term wrong. Right. Correct. That, like, and then we, and then you have poor Charlotte with this, like, very Catholic mindset of sin means hell. Right. Avoid sin. Right. And... Now she's like, now she has to grasp on whether or not God will still love her. Or even if she like, because now I'm like, well, God, who knows? Like, maybe she moved on to Greek mythology because she's like, well, God's going to be done with me. So I guess I'll just move on to the I next. Move on. I think your point to- highlights really well just how subjective right and wrong is. Yeah. Because what's right and wrong in Christianity isn't always true in other religions as we see unfold with Roe v. Wade being knocked down and no. the Jewish community spearheading, it's, you know, challenging that. Um, and aside from that, too, like, there's... What's the movie with Dave Batista coming out? Oh, The Cabin? The M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Yeah, I want to see that real bad. Knock at the door or something? Knock something at the like cabin. that. And it's like, you know, I've seen the trailer several times because you get hijacked in the movie theater and you, ha- you get forced into it. And again, yeah. that's also a thing where it's like, you know, his whole thing is like, we have to sacrifice one of you for this thing to happen. So in their minds, that's what's right. That's what's right. But in um, my mind, I'm like, sacrificing is bad. <laughs> Please don't Ginny, sacrifice a human life. Like, Jenny and Georgia also struggle with that. And then like, um, 
what's his name what's the dad's name the hot dad's name zion so zion's hot. new girlfriend is like well the reason why i can be a defense attorney is because right and the law is usually gray and sometimes there are circumstances yeah there are i mean i hate the whole concept of like you must follow every law to the t well for my community the black community that meant we weren't allowed to vote yeah. until the middle of the 20th century so if people had sat aside and just quietly abided by the, those laws and restrictions black people would not have the right to vote in the way that we do today so that it so she's when people talk about following the law you're just like i always tell my kid follow the laws that are right or follow yeah. the laws that make sense unless if no that's not what i say i say follow the law unless it violates your personal rights <laughs> in the very this is their very first campaign where it's like you don't even know if you're going to get a following following or a fan base or whatever and people usually like keep it pretty clean keep it pretty cut brendan lee mulligan made a character say out loud and remember kids Laws are just for the weak <laughs> willed, and it's how the government keeps you down. And I was like, Ugh. I love, I love Brennan Lee Mulligan is the original feral rebel of my soul. Like, I will live my entire life as feral as he acts. I love that. I love that. But it does, it does make this, it, and I don't think it makes it complicated. A lot of people want to say it's complicated, but I don't think it truly is because I think if all of our needs are met as humans, shelter, mm -hmm. food, you know, it, transportation is a basic right now because, you know, nobody lives within walking distance of anything anymore, right? right? Um, medical care you know that kind of stuff so if all of our basic needs are being met people generally can live in harmony it's when you peel back the layers of oppression and realize like people's needs aren't being met in such extreme degrees that sort of breed these sort of ha quote heinous yeah. behaviors because now it's like well i have to survive so if if my I only realize survive... we're not using my good camera <laughs> oh whoopsie whoopsie so, like, if my only means of survival is selling drugs, yeah. you know, or I could go to McDonald's and make $15 an hour, we, we fundamentally know $15 an hour is not enough money for a person to live and survive in this country. So, well, like, if I can make $150K selling drugs or work at McDonald's because it's, quote, honorable, but it's also not because people who not. work at McDonald's get demeaned all the time for all working time. at McDonald's. And not that I would actually sell drugs because I'm terrified yeah. of going to jail. <laughs> but but I've also lived, you know, in, in a privileged state because I had the choice of being able to have jobs in, in, in that are, quote, respectable. But what if my folks, I'm the daughter of a black man. What if he had never left the Midwest? What if my grandparents never left the South? What would my options be? Well, and the thing of it is, too, is like scarcity makes people violent. Uh huh. And it's and even the idea of scarcity makes people violent. Let's take it back to the beginning of the pandemic where people had an inkling toilet <laughs> that toilet paper might not be available to them. Which is the they're... most random item to hoard during a fucking pandemic. And then let's take it back to our childhood. People got violent over whether or not their kid was getting a tickle me Elmo. Yeah, you know what's crazy? Home economics. I don't know if you watch that show. It's on ABC. It's on after elementary. Anyway, one of the characters' children wanted this thing because she's like, You did this amazing thing. I want to reward you, blah, blah. And he's like, Cool, I mm -hmm. want this. So her very wealthy brother-in-law is like, oh, that's going to be really hard to get. Let's figure this out. So they figure out where to find it. And he's like, you need to go now. The store opens tomorrow, but you need to go right now to get in line. So she does. And in line, she learns nobody else in line is there to genuinely own the product. They are there to buy it and, and then, then price it. gouge it online. Yeah. <laughs> because Welcome that's the, the culture Swift. we've bred. Yeah. That's the culture we've created intentionally. So the very idea of Cher kissing the one boy that Charlotte has ever felt connected to, because now it all hangs on him. Like, right. I'm giving up God. <laughs> I'm giving up 
religion. I'm giving I mean, up my I future would give as up a nun. Celibacy for Jake, Jake right. Ryan too. So Maybe she's, before I found out he was not a good guy. So she's hung it all on him in one kiss when JFK died. Yeah. And now her mother is taking away the one thing. So she immediately goes, "I'll get fucking violent." Yeah. I will get fucking violent. I will take over your entire personality <laughs> because it's scarcity. Everything can literally be rooted back to why are we anxious? Scarcity. Yeah. Why are we depressed? Scarcity. Yeah. When you have uncertainty uh, in a lot of ways, where am I going to sleep tonight? What am I going to eat today? How are these things going to work? And it's for me, it's breaking that generational trauma. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I don't use that as leverage with my kid when he needs something. An incident came up a couple months ago. He was parallel parking, tapped somebody's as car. Yeah. Tapped somebody's car. People saw it because, you know, he lives in Los Angeles. So it's mm-hmm. pretty obvious. So he left a note because that's what you do and left his number. I don't even know how long ago this was. He told me when he got home from winter break. So we're talking this had to somewhere sometime last year. Today, he calls me and he's like, mom, you remember the story? They finally reached out. And I was like, well, that's bullshit that they took so long to reach out to you. You, There's no damage. But then until they removed this one thing, there's some damage and it's going to cost this much money to fix it. And I was like, yeah, I'll pay for it. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, because why am I going to have an 18-year-old kid who's never had a job? Well, he used to umpire, but still... Who's going through, like, I'm not going to put that stress on you to figure out how to pay this. I have the means to do it. I'm going to do it so you can feel focused on your studies. And and my parents didn't do that for me. It was very much like, you did this. You fucking figure it out. And it's like, I ain't got no money. Like, how do I figure this out? Like, are you going to give me a clue? Can I at least have, like, a map (laughs) to help me figure this out? Nope. Figure it out. You're an adult now. Figure it out. I hate that mindset. It's so cruel because who's to say you're going to figure it out in a way that's helpful to you in the long run? Yeah. By any means necessary, I guess. Right? Like, I would rather give him the money than he try Because he, you know what he's going to do? He's going to do something kind in return to me, for me, or for someone else. Because again, when we're living in a community mindset, everyone's needs get met. Mm -hmm. And then we don't have reasons to punch one another. I did ask for, you know, the, um, uh, what do you call it? You know, when they give you, it's the quote. I did ask for a copy of the quote so I could pay it. (laughs) What is it called? Because I, you know, like, it just, whatever, whatever, like the situation, whatever. But it's like, yeah, we're going to handle it. I don't need you to feel stressed out about this situation. I don't want you to come home and take my car keys because you're so mad Mm -hmm. (laughs) and pull a Charlotte. (laughs) Yeah. I will say for as much as women are demonized through the script and the actions of this movie, in the way that Cher and Winona actually act chemistry wise, mm-hmm. there is like the absence of a mother body shaming her right. child right. or like overly sexualizing her or like calling her a loser or a nerd or whatever. Yeah. Like, again, Cher wasn't that bad of a mom. <laughs> right. It was, I, you know, one of the things I think why your mom probably loves this movie so much is because it does have a vibe to it where you can feel comfort and share in a way yeah right like the things that she teases charlotte for are not things that are things that are within charlotte's control Mm -hmm. like you can't always control what you look like genetics just happens and so you can't control what food does to your body right and so for her to not body shame her and just kind of like you know we're jewish right like uh, that kind of shit i feel like we would all be better off. <laughs> we would all if, be better if, off. If, I know. If the, the focus was on building a relationship with your child rather than trying to make them fit the mold that you believe they should fit. Well, and I don't believe that there's any reason to believe that Cher is no less of a good or bad mom because at the end of the movie, she's screaming, we're going to do life my way because I'm the adult. Yeah. And it's my life until it's your life. <laughs> Which is true. But I think the way she handles it is in a way where it's like, 
she's acknowledging once you have control of your life, you can have control of your life. Right. Whereas I don't know about your experience. Shit, I'm a, I'm almost fucking forty, and I still am trying. I'm still somebody's still trying to control me. Yeah. As their child. Yeah. No, I thought that that was one of the more cathartic par- parts of the movie because I'm like, well, yeah. All of our moms are just ladies who had babies. Mm -hmm. They're just ladies. Like they weren't, it wasn't divine intervention. It wasn't a calling. It wasn't, they're literally just women who happen to also get pregnant. And you, we learn that Cher wasn't that much older than Winona, than Charlotte. Cher was your age (laughs) when, when you had your baby. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You and, and that, Cher. that makes a big difference. And in the lack of knowledge that Charlotte has, we can only assume that, you know, uh, Cher has even less knowledge at that time, 20 yeah. years earlier. No kidding. She said, he made me feel special for about a minute and a half. I went, oh, I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> I have been there. And thank God I willed myself to never have a baby. <laughs> Honestly. Because it's... Uh, because it is I once I don't know it's hard because we don't have conversations we don't have true and real conversations about what having a family would look like and what that means for you and if you even want one we just that, assume that doctor wouldn't even tell her what the exam was going to entail before his I guess it was gloved who knows it was a 15 it, second like you know they I heard the glove go on okay yeah before his fingers were inside of her and I was like well whoa I go also we have to stop perpetuating this myth that there is a physical aspect to virginity virginity is fake yes thank <laughs> you because he was like oh you're still a virgin I was like you couldn't feel that you couldn't you feel that know. you don't know you don't know get your hand out of her that was horrible horrifying did you, did you watch Fleischman in trouble no I haven't watched it yet but okay. I'm going to well, yeah, there's a similar situation. Yeah. And it's horrible. And we should not be treating women this way. This is why men shouldn't be gynecologists. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> but like, literally, like, didn't even ask her why she was there. Didn't any introduce himself to anything. Just like, love. <laughs> And she's like, why am I? And she's just laying there, legs closed, doesn't understand why she had to get undressed. Like, no one's explaining anything She was like, her. I literally just had two questions. I literally just had two questions. Yeah. Even gives a fake name because, again, back to that reputation and what you do and how your reputation, reputation impacts your life. Well, and back to Cher leaving every time the reputation thing was going to get a little bit dicey. Yeah. No one was kind in mm-hmm. the 60s that still haunted me when i left college to enter the workforce where it's like well i don't know if you'll get a job around schools here because you know your mom left a job in the middle of the year and that's gonna follow you and i was like well maybe i'll change my last name like <laughs> oh i understand i mean i gave my child my last name for a reason yeah it's one of those things where it's like small t- small towns talk the most mm-hmm. and then they blacklist you from everything the fact that Cher like was able to she should never leave that town she's got Lou she's got a whole group of like sassy women who are on her side mm-hmm. who are like make out with Joe but also Mary Lou we don't care <laughs> yeah yeah I really okay just a moment for Lou I freaking loved when he first saw her and he was just like, this is the most beautiful woman. Cher is the most beautiful and She's woman. fucking gorgeous. She's fucking gorgeous. But the way he, he's like dumbstruck with like her, by her charisma. Mm-hmm. And then he maintained, like it doesn't go away no. as he gets to know her. And even in their fight, he still wants her and wants to be with her. Their literal sparring their verbal like i was like oh this is why i pick fights <laughs> i pick fights because i watched this movie and i was like oh that's how you flirt it's hot yeah. <laughs> because like they're on the same page yeah yeah and i loved it i love the way that they talk to one another i love that he tried to like he was gonna paint her and then she's like you know you suck at this yes. right 
<laughs> he was like, yeah, and I then, didn't tell you I was good. <laughs> I just told then, you I liked it. The other part of what I love about their relationship is she's not hung up on the fact that she's a foot taller than him. Uh-uh. And neither is he. He doesn't give a rat's that there's a height difference, that she is, you know, that people are going to question whether or not they should be together because mm-hmm. of their physical differences. It is just holy buckets. I find you attractive. And she's like, I think you might be kind of cute too. Yeah. And they just go for it. It's like, it's like a win for everybody who just wants to be loved. Yeah. It's so cute. And we're in like peak share, uh, cheekbone era where i'm like oh, oh so so gross. just so good it. and that hair i know my mom tried to copy that hair yeah. <laughs> like my mom, so wanted, good. my mom wanted to be mrs flax um mm. i also think that it's cute that out of one scene of all of them being on the um, on all three women being on the same page as something that's what we named the movie after yeah yeah it's just, it's so cute. Yeah. It's a great movie. Did you like it overall? I didn't realize it was your first time watching it. Yeah, I did actually really enjoy it. And it made me nostalgic for a time when movies could just sort of exist and tell stories in a way that didn't mm-hmm. have, I don't know, something else involved. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't care if there's like another message or whatever, but I it, there's something about, I've been feeling this way for a while. There's something about the way I remember the 90s being very comforting and I don't know. Do you know there what? Was, it, there's a lot of know, shit in the 90s that it was trash, but like. I know. I don't know. Do you know what it put me in the mood for? Immediately I turned it off and I went, I wonder if riding in cars with boys <gasps> is dreamy. I love riding in cars with too. boys. I love that movie That's too. I can't, my- I, I can't actually watch it with my kid in the house because it triggers lots of things oh, yeah. for us. I I love that movie. I think it is Drew Barrymore's best movie, yeah. hands down. Yeah. And um. Oh no. What? I don't like that. I've forgotten her name, Brittany Murphy. Oh yeah, Brittany Murphy. <laughs> it's just a wonderful movie that mm-hmm. should be on our list for this because it's so good. It's uh an adaptation of a book. I know. I've never read the book. I've Mermaid's never read the book feel- either. Mermaids feels like an adaptation of a book, but I do not think that it is. It has a very book vibe. You know, and maybe that's what it is about the 90s and even 80s films and everything prior to, like, let's say 1999. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like there's a really big shift in 2000 where, th- where it's like after 50 years of television, they finally figured it the fuck out and changed the way it's done. Because yeah. there's still sort of this, like, literary or like theater vibe that comes from a lot of you know um things that have like these really interesting what am i trying to say there's still a theater to it there's still yeah theater there's still theater to it to the storytelling and and the way that it's presented to everybody and yeah they have a lot of different scenes and a lot of different settings but at the same time it still works because you need these sort of anchor spots for the story to work we are also fed so many of the same movies over and over and over again. We're in the 90s. I felt like every time I was going to the movies, it was a different story. Yeah. It was a different cast. Even the remakes were felt original, right? Like Father of the Bride felt original. Parent Trap felt original. Like there's there's just this, this dedication to like, okay, how do we take this and make it feel like an, an experience for right. somebody? I can't think of like the only movie I can, the only pair of movies I can even think like run almost so parallel is um, Anywhere But Here and where the heart is but yeah. i'm like i just think that they both have natalie portman and ashley judd in them <laughs> i don't even think that they have the similar stories i just think oh. that you could buy them as a duo in the yeah. dvd set <laughs> yeah i always kind of put them together in my head too yeah. but then but we the- even eventually in the in the later 2000s like remember Remember, we would have like several years where accidentally the same movie would come yeah, out twice. Friends like with had, benefits, friends no with attached, and no strings attached. I'm like, this is the same movie. The same no movie. one talked to one another. Yeah, like yeah. 
I couldn't even tell. M- Mila Kunis is in one. Friends with Benefits with Justin Timberlake. That's the oh. one I like better because yeah, no it's the better one. Kinda, yeah, it's the better one. And then what's No Strings Attached? Who's in that one? Ashton Kutcher and Natalie Portman. I hate Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He did a really good job. I just watched this movie called, was it called Vengeance? It was written by B.J. Novak. I thought he did a really good job in that film. I just find him very obnoxious, Um, which I guess is his whole shtick. I did love Butterfly Effect, though. I love it. God, it's been ages since I've seen Butterfly Effect. Oh, does it not make your cut for being too scary? It's supposed to be scary. I know. Well, I, I, so I think I cut off scary stuff around 2004. Well, that's not true. Um, as my child grew, my tolerance for things that are intense and scary decreased. Okay. Gotcha. Like, we went and saw The Departed. His father and I were together at the time when that film released. Mm-hmm. I didn't, we saw we saw like a six o'clock showing. Girl, I did not sleep for a week after that movie. All right. Also, I found it very. I'm ready to wrap up. Okay. How, what was your comfort level with this movie? Overall, I would say I'm very comfortable with it, and it and it has a good wintry afternoon vibe to it. So it'll mm-hmm. probably make it into my rotation of winter movies. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um. I do. Do I love that? It's very much like women are kind of trash. No. But at the same time, there's some. Re- there's so much redeeming. Qu- there's so many redeeming qualities about it that you can excuse the fact that whoever wrote this story hates women. <laughs> Correct. I am also still very comfy with this movie, despite the fact that a teenager. And an adult have an inappropriate moment in a bell tower. I wish I would have never have caught the line where they said he was 26. I physically wrote that down. I go, I wish I had never heard that line. So the writers were, uh, the writer is Patty D- Dan and the, who wrote the novel. It is a novel. Look at oh, you. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to get it. Do we need to read this in our book club? Maybe. Oh my God. I would love to know more about sharing this movie. And then June Roberts wrote the screenplay, but Richard Benjamin was the director. And you know, I, I have that theory a lot yeah. that I adopted from my friend that if a woman writes the screenplay and men, and men often don't execute it well. <laughs> In terms of like first. being fem, being fem forward, <laughs> but I also think that if you add, it, if I was a mother watching it with my twelve-year-old, much like my mother did with me, I would have had a conversation with twelve-year-old me to be like, you know, that Cher didn't mean that she was going to sign off on Winona dating Joe, right? Like we need to, because my family is also a very sarcastic family, so it's like we need to understand, yeah. The difference between sarcasm and teasing and us giving you the green light to something. And and I think if it was a female director, she would have done a better job at offering direction to make that clear for the audience. Yeah. Because I don't think a man's going to understand that because men just think women are conniving and sexual and will do anything to get ahead when really they hold all the power. So that's how we have to behave sometimes. (laughs) Um, and I think that like there is still a conversation to be had when it comes to Charlotte and Joe's relationship where it's like, do you see how easy it is to pin all my mom used to use paradise by the dashboard lights as that lesson for me, we would get to mm. the part where he's like, and now I'm praying for the end of time and she'd turn the radio down and she'd be like, what did we learn? <laughs> we learned that they'll tell you anything to get you naked in their car. Mm-hmm. And then they'll even tell you that they'll marry you and then you'll make them marry you. And then they'll hate you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I feel like Cher having that. And I wonder if it happens more fleshed out in a book where Cher sits down and is like, let's talk about hanging all of our hopes on one dude named Joe. Yeah. One very socially anxious, sad man named Joe. Yeah. Because he is endearing. Like he is like he's he gives me like Quasimodo vibes, even though he's like very good looking. Like he's, he's just so like, handsome. He's so handsome and he's so soft spoken. And I probably also 
would have tried to sit on his lap on the bus. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm. And other places. <laughs> and other places. I probably also would have been like, you know what will make me feel better about John F. Kennedy? May he rest in peace. You dick. <laughs> You dick. Um, it's like that scene in High Fidelity in the movie where she, yeah. they at her dad's funeral, they have sex in the car because she's like, I need to feel something different, and you're right here, so whip it out. And you're right here. <laughs> um, so I am still fine with saying that this is one of my favorite movies because I think that you can have all really. I don't think that we should eliminate iffy things happening in movies. I think that's what we've done, and that's why movies suck now. Because they there's no nuance to it. No, like I don't I don't know if anybody if we've forgotten how or if we're scared to have yeah. the nuance because the internet is so quick, the internet is so black and white and so quick to say this is bad, this is wrong, you're awful, but no one's willing to have that conversation of mm -hmm. like, hey, maybe that's a nuance. Like the new yeah. you people, the movie Kenya Burst just released with Jonah Hill is getting dragged, and I'm just like, I. I you guys, as the product of a mixed race couple, I just felt like there was a lot of things in here that were great. <laughs> I just really did. Um, so, I because I think before the twenty six year old line, I was like, "Well, what will we talk about?" Because yes. eventually, we're going to get to the point where there's nothing to talk about when it comes to movies. Yeah. That's why I think that Marvel does just enough of a good job. To make their villains a little bit in the gray. So mm -hmm. my brain still works hard during the movie. And that's yeah. why I sleep during the battles. Because my brain doesn't have to work hard during the battles. Yeah. yeah. I can just take my Marvel nap in the middle of the movie. <laughs> I can just take my Marvel nap in the middle. <laughs> Speaking of, Civil War was on last night. You know that made me oh, happy. God. So I'm still comfy. I hope that everyone puts mermaids on their winter list. Yeah. I forgot that all of the action happened on New Year's Eve. I was like, why is this a January movie? Oh, literally the climax of the movie is New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah. And it feels good. It feels good to be a winter movie. Like it has everything. And even though it ends in spring, it's still, you, yeah. it, you know, we have the hope of spring towards the end of January. So I would love for People Magazine to do one of those weird like reunited uh spotlights on Cher, Winona Ryder and Christina Ricci to talk about like how they feel about this movie now especially you know, with it being Christina's first movie yeah and you know I'm surprised I, I was surprised to learn that I don't think they've ever done a movie together since and I've never no. seen them publicly together that I can recall so I thought that was very interesting because you know how some people will make movies and then they become friends for life and mm -hmm. there's just all of this like hoopla and there's no hoopla around them. You mean how like One Fine Day was so good that Julia Roberts could only kiss George Clooney in movies? <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer was in One Fine Day. Oh, it was Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. I always rewrite it as Julia Roberts. Because that's what you wish it was. <laughs> I know. Uh, One Fine Day, though, is the reason why I think a perfect movie is 90 minutes long. <laughs> well, because it is a perfect movie. It is. It's a perfect movie. That movie is perfect. And I love movies. Movie. Carly and I have had this conversation. She talks about how she loves movies that take place in, like, a night or a yeah. day. And I was thinking about that after our conversation. I thought, oh, my God. Actually, I do as well. <laughs> yeah. Because it's real tight. It's mm -hmm. just tight. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I – Yeah. Because I thought that Winona Ryder and Cher was the winning combo. Yeah. I was like, how did this never happen, happen again? again? Yeah. Or I mean, Tom really Hanks and Meg Ryan were so good. They did it again eight years later. Also, like, Winona and Christina Ricci. When Christina Ricci got older, well, then Winona was going through it. It was her. her time. It was her girl interrupted phase. I will always stick up for Winona. We all go feral sometimes. That's like a movie, though. Girl Interrupted is a real good movie. Stealing is also just a crime because they want to punish us for being poor. Well, she wasn't poor. She wasn't poor. <laughs> there, but there was a different reason why she was, there was stealing. There was a different reason. And somebody she needed should have Yeah. Like, and that's another Someone thing, too, helped right? Her. Somebody should have helped her instead of punishing her. But we don't help people. We just punish women. Specifically women. How dare we try and help women and improve our society? Mm. Jules, tell people where they can find you. 
Hi, friends. I'm Julia Washington, your host of Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous, where we analyze pop culture through the lens of race or gender and sometimes both. You can find me on Instagram, both under Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous or the Julia Washington, T H E Julia Washington. And um, it's not that exciting to follow me, I guess. I don't know. Or you could. You could. It's fun. It's fun. I mean, I don't know. I love my Instagram. We truly need to work on your. I know. Uh, January is hard because I go through a phase of like, well, nobody really wants to hear from me. People, do they even like me? Like, January is a dark, dark month for me. Let me just look to the right to my vision board that I hung up yesterday. Nice. I'm proud and of just you. remind you that your voice counts because you have value. Now I'm literally just pointing at things that are on. Get your groove on with certainty, Jules. <laughs> I will. How are will, we supposed to be eating ladies with that attitude? I know. I know. Because January's a bitch. It gets I hate to me. January. What a stupid month. We survived the holiday season just for it to snow and rain at the same time. Why? Yeah, why? February is when I start to terrible. feel good again. I don't know what it is. What a terrible month. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is. It's a bad month. It's a bad month. I hate it's a bad it here. Month. I hate it here. Two more days. Well, uh, Really, one more day. Everyone, it is fun following me. You want to know why? Because I take everyday misogyny and tell you that it's a pain in the ass, but I do it with a smile and with a charm that no one can replicate. <laughs> yes, this is true. I enjoy I following you. So follow me at to all the follow this channel to mm -hmm. all the men I've tolerated before, because if you're not a podcast app listener, you can listen to every episode on YouTube. Um, follow me at men I've tolerated pod on Instagram so you can catch our other live show tomorrow night, which is about One Tree Hill season three, which I thought was tonight, which Jules <laughs> thought was tonight, which made me panic because I was like, she didn't watch mermaids. <laughs> but I did. But I spent all day watching One Tree Hill. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's fine. <laughs> our next still comfy besides One Tree Hill, but he, on on YouTube will be Titanic. Uh, titanic over on pop culture makes me jealous because they're re-releasing it for valentine's day friends i know should you be able to win an oscar for your score if i can literally just recreate <laughs> it by making mouse sounds <laughs> <laughs> and that's our promo for titanic i will cut this out to be like no no <laughs> i love you celine um, I remember today how long Titanic is, and now I'm yeah. Like, God, <laughs> it was two when I owned it. It was two two, was two VHS cassettes. tapes two in cassettes. one, and I was like, "But we're trying to jump on that wagon of you know Fucking trend." James so. Cameron. Fucking James Cameron. I fucking hate James Cameron. He doesn't know how to make a short movie. He doesn't know how keep, to make a good they just movie. Keep giving him money to make I'm, long ass you know, movies. I'm you know, Avatar was like deeply offensive. I forget to which community, but like they're like, don't go the see indigenous it. community. That's it. Thank you. I was like, because I, I tune out when people talk shit about James Cameron. I'm like, I already know. We hate. We don't like He's him. A bad, bad man. Like Ryan Murphy. <laughs> Who Ryan Murphy got you because he cried during the Emmys or something. No, because like, he's he a bad, elevated, bad man. No, he elevated all of the black and queer people he worked with who took 25 years to get any recognition in their careers. That got me. But you're not wrong. He built his career on taking the queer community, people of color, and the disabled community and making them sideshows in his shows. <laughs> like his old shows. I know. And then being like, but it was historically accurate. I know. I so just... anyways, follow me at Men I've Tolerated Pod for more um, tea on Ryan Murphy and why he's <laughs> terrible, but I'll still wa make Jules watch Glee one time for this show. <laughs> and Or that documentary. And catch us next time for my rendition of My Heart Will Go On. <laughs> I am so curious to see i was obs i i was in third grade when titanic came out and i can't <gasps> wait to see if it holds up i was so i told mario mm -hmm. he was like oh my gosh are you excited about titanic i said listen i when i saw titanic at the briggsmore th movie theater which is no longer there i was like i love this movie because i had a Everyone thing for it. leonardo dicaprio because growing pains it. then all the basic ass bitches at school came back and were like, we love Titanic. And it's like, well, I'm not getting on that wagon because I don't want to be anything like you people. 
I was the complete opposite. Everyone came back to school, you know, like I love Titanic. And I was like, my fucking dad won't let me see it because they get naked once. <laughs> And then I don't I, think you see anything. No, you don't. I think you see her nibbles when he draws her, or you see a drawing of a her drawing nipples. of yeah. So, anyways, catch us up for like <laughs> ship nudity next week in two weeks, two weeks or yeah. still comfy, and we'll see you tomorrow on the River Court. And remember, everybody, stay cozy, stay comfy. <laughs> Boom.